Welcome to Build with Rob. I am Rob Deerdeck, CEO and founder of the Deerdeck Machine, the one of a kind venture creation studio that systematically fuses art, science, and magic to manufacture amazing companies. That's what we do down here. That's what we do down here. And on this show, what do we love to do? We just love to talk about building companies. I don't care what stage it's at. You know, are you in the diligence stage? Are you in the build stage? Are you in the launch stage? Are you in the scale stage? Uh, all of these stages are incredibly important. Um, and at any time, one single idea from one mentor, conversation, anything can literally change the trajectory of your business. And that's what I hope to do on this show, especially when I'm talking to young entrepreneurs that are super driven and have an idea and a vision and they're, they're marching out into the valley of death, uh, hoping to uh, drive this idea to product market fit and really live the dream of creating a successful, sustainable, profitable, and maybe acquirable business. Um, it's, it's something that I love to do, again, is speaking with entrepreneurs and, and, and looking into their concepts, understanding what they're trying to achieve and see if I can't give them some help. Uh, and today we have yet again another very special episode where we are featuring two entrepreneurs from the Venture Accelerator at UCLA Anderson. And again, UCLA Anderson uh, is just an amazing entrepreneur college program. You know, it's it's really one of the very first ones that was ever created 50 years ago by the great Dr. Al Osborne, okay? Really saw the vision for uh, what entrepreneurship means and how to drive it uh, into a more structured educational system so that you can create great entrepreneurs, I think, throughout time. You know, you you went and got a business degree and then like if you chose, if fate brought you to becoming an entrepreneur, uh, well, then you became one, right? It's, it's only now is it um, much more of part of the process of when you decide what you want to do with your life where you can now add being an entrepreneur to that list. You know, I, I think it's, it's one of the great things that's happened over the last, you know, it, call it 10 years or so of really recognizing that um, it is a pathway, a uh, career path for you and, and places like UCLA Anderson really support it at, at the highest level. Um, you know, and, and for me just to be associated with it, uh, I really love it. I love all aspects of it. You know, I love their venture accelerator program. I think they do it, you know, first class. They have a lot of great companies in there. Um, great resources, support for these young entrepreneurs, uh, trying to realize these visions. Um, and, and one thing that I really, really love about, um, UCLA is they do a showcase, um, you know, every year where they bring, let, let all of the companies inside the accelerator, like pitch, um, pitch their business ideas, you know, and, and, and a lot of great people, investors, all different type of people, um, you know, will show up for the event now that now they're virtual, you know, and, uh, you know, pre COVID, um, you know, they were the, the big events and it's, it's, a, it's an amazing you know, experience, I think, you know, both as someone who's just a fan of all things entrepreneurial, but but also a place for them to really share their ideas, share their vision and and give them access to both mentorship and potential capital partners uh, as part of uh, the Venture Accelerator program, you know. And, you know, I, look, I'm in there, I'm putting pressure on these entrepreneurs. Well, I'm sitting front row. I'm sitting front row. I'm nodding when I understand. I'm shaking my head when I don't. Just kidding. Just kidding. Imagine. Imagine I was like like silently hating on someone's pitch uh, by sitting in the front row, giving him like a, a, a head nod saying, I don't think that's going to work. That Tam, don't believe it. Um, but look, I, I'm... I love the program. And, and here, here's something that, that I, I, I just really think is... is you know, special about not only the showcase that they do, but but what being in a program, 
like a venture accelerator could really be for you. You know, it, it's it's a chance for you to get so much feedback from other people about your idea. You know, I mean, there's there's a uh, residence, uh, entrepreneur in residence, like my good friend Rod Kurtz that can can help shape the idea and give you feedback. There's there's great mentor programs in inside the accelerator that that allow other experienced entrepreneurs to to come in and, and support. Um, you know, look, they even have access to end up on a sh- on a show like Build with Rob, where we get to discuss and be a part of uh, helping evolve an idea and giving them feedback and ideas. But I, but I can't say it enough. For anybody building a company, you have to go out and get feedback during the process of creating it. And, it, and I don't care. I don't care if you're in in the launch phase. I don't care if you're in the uh, the build phase, the design phase, or the scale phase, you want to go out and get feedback, critical feedback, and you have to listen to it. You know, I, I think that one of the the thing, here, here's one of the things with entrepreneurs, they're, they're, they love their idea, they're super driven to realize that idea, bring that vision to life, and they're so used to hearing the story of like, oh, you're turned down for all this time, and then it took one investor, and then it became a billion-dollar company. You're so used to hearing this idea that, that you know, people just don't understand your vision, and when you finally find the person that does, then the world will see it, and then it will be a great success. And, and a lot of times that may be true. But, but the truth is, it, it is one of the most essential things that you can do while creating a business is getting as much feedback as possible. And that doesn't mean you need to constantly be rethinking every one of your ideas and try to continue to evolve it into where everybody thinks it's great. But you got to be open to hearing that feedback and looking for insight into that feedback. If, if everyone you... Uh, show your product to taste it and says that it tastes sour um, and it's not very good. Everyone's not wrong because you just love a sour taste and you think it's amazing, right? It, it's when everybody looks at a product and says, well, wow, like, you know, I have something similar, only it's like half the price. You can't be like, oh, no, it's not similar. It's like mine's blue, Right. Like you, you, you can't try to get all defensive on feedback. You, you've got to be open minded to the feedback and you want to get as much of it as possible. You know, you, you really want to build a company with the idea of like, I think this is amazing. Let me go out and see if other people think this is amazing too. And, and it's, it's that it serves two purposes, right? It, it can help validate when you have a really, really strong, amazing idea that you really believe in. And then everybody like is like, wow, that is uh, perfect. That sour taste, oh, to die for, right? Like it's all of these different things just are other tools for you to shape your idea at that very early stage. Because, you know, what you can do with evolving and shaping and you know micro failing and pivoting your at the idea stage uh will will only like lead you to a quicker path of success and, a, and an accelerated trajectory towards product market fit and and you never want to stop getting feedback you know the whole way through you know because it it is one of those things that you know you know, your team, the people closest to you that are responsible for creating and developing the idea, creating and developing the marketing, creating and developing all aspects of the brand and love the brand, um, you're eventually just going to be in a beautiful bubble of yes. This extraordinary bubble of yes, where you are just like, is this amazing? Yes. What do you think? Yes. Like, should we do this? Yes. Should it be this? Yes. Is this going to sell? Yes. You get it to market? Consumer going to buy it? No. No. Right? Because you didn't get out there and get feedback and test it and get that understanding. So just something I think everybody should be be thoughtful about uh, and, and always be considerate of. And, and again, I think um, this 
today's episode uh, has two great entrepreneurs that were hand selected from the Venture Accelerator program at UCLA Anderson, and and you know, great aspect of that accelerator is they're constantly giving the entrepreneurs feedback and giving them a chance to learn and evolve and shape their ideas, thus giving them. Uh, a better chance for success. And and part of that process is you've ended up on the Build With Rob show where we get to discuss your ideas and let me give you my insight and input. So without further ado, let us bring in two amazing companies. Hi, my name's John. I'm the co-founder of Nectar Hard Seltzer. Back in 2019, when White Claw had its explosive summer, um, me and my co-found, other co-founder, Jeremy, noticed that everyone was doing the same thing. Same four flavors, not building a story, not um, building a brand. And, you know, we just kind of got fatigued with, you know, grapefruit, lime, black cherry, mango. So we set out to do something different. Um, we started the first Asian art seltzer, focusing on Asian flavors, but, you know, beyond that, really trying to um, create a company that's bigger than just a drink. And, you know, Red Bull is a, a huge uh, inspiration to us. And I think on the level of what we hope to achieve one day and, um, you know, a big part of building a business, uh, I think any business nowadays is creating content uh, in an authentic way to both the brand, but also to you as the creator and staying relevant. John Dolce, welcome to Build with Rob. How are you? Good, how are you doing? Man, it's like, how often do you wear one of the colorful wigs, man? I mean, you got this luscious, beautiful, uh, swaying hair. I don't even know if you could fit a wig over that thing. And I'm, I'm trying to grow it out, so it's just a permanent wig, you know? Yeah, look, I, I you know, I got to tell you, um, I'm extremely impressed with what you've been able to do already with the brand. Um, both from a marketing perspective, a creative perspective, but above all, navigating the most complex industry that there is on the entire earth that is alcohol. You know what I mean? It is it is a very, very daunting and hardcore industry to, to attempt to go in and take over. But before we get into that, can you tell us a little bit about your brand and, and the vision for it uh, and, and, and when you started it and why you started it? Yeah, uh, I can quick background, I guess. Um, so I grew up in New Jersey, right outside of Philly. Uh, you know, I went to school in Santa Barbara, and that's where I met, you know, my best friend, the co-founder, Jer- the other co-founder, Jeremy. Um, you know, whole life thought I was going to be a doctor. Siblings are, you know, went into medicine, uncles, aunts, whatever, uh, studying for the MCATs. And uh, my junior year of college, my mom passed away unexpectedly. And at that point, it was like, okay, I just need to, you know, finish school as fast as possible, move back home. And in that process, I had no idea what I wanted to do. But my dad, I uh, was an early investor in a craft brewery at the time. So I got involved there and, you know, stepping foot into that business, you know, everyone looked at me like, okay, he's no experience, just out of college. He's only here because his dad was an investor. And at the time, that was a little bit frustrating to me. But in retrospect, it was definitely the best thing to ever happen because, you know, for the brewmaster to look at me eye to eye is an equal. Um, you know, I had to put in my time, you know, wake up every day with him at 5 a.m. and learn how to brew and show him I was serious. And, you know, do the same thing with the packaging guys, the sales team, and even externally, you know, being the youngest kid uh, in a room with a distributor is intimidating, but, you know, I had to know my shit for them to take me serious and same thing with retailers. So um, that was back in like 2014, 2015. We went on to be one of the fastest growing breweries in New Jersey. And um, in 2019, when White Call Summer kind of happened, uh, it was really funny to me how everyone jumping into the space was doing the same thing. The you know, same four flavors, grapefruit, lime, black cherry, mango. No one was telling a story. No one was building a brand. Um, and that's when I reached out uh, to my best friend, Jeremy. The whole time I was in the beer world, he was um, in artist management. You know, he was literally taking kids out of their bedrooms and turning them into multi-million dollar international touring acts. And in the music industry, you can't go raise money. Uh, like you can with a business. So like they had to do this with zero dollars, zero budget. He really opened up the whole internet to me in terms of how calculated everything is. So I just knew him as a good marketer and came to him with the idea initially just for help. And then he ended up calling me back a few weeks later and was like, hey, like this doesn't exist. I just talked to my friend in Shanghai, you know, hard seltzer doesn't exist in Asia. Let's make the first Asian hard seltzer, break it in the US and then take it overseas. And I'm your partner now. This isn't for the brewery. Uh, And that's... (laughs) 
kind of how it started. You know, that was 2019, end of it. No one saw COVID happen. You know, we could spend hours telling you all the, the trials and tribulations we went through. Um, got wrecked in a million different ways. But long story short, October 2020, finally had a box. And we are like, okay, we'll hit the ground running. There's no other Asian art seltzers. Uh, went to 200 stores in LA. No one said no. No one said yes. There's this awkward gray area where it's like... <laughs> <laughs> why, hey, why do you think that is? You think because they're like oh, Asian hard seltzer. I'm not sure what that means exactly. Were they just confused by that? Like what? So, what do you so think it was? Like, prove that you have a following and, or prove that you have sales. And we had neither yet. Right. Because we weren't able to sell the product. And so that was kind of like really the stagnation. So you know, we turned to TikTok and, uh, you know, Jeremy, the other co-founder, had really seen what that was able to do to musicians who weren't able to get exposure. And, you know, overnight, we had a couple of videos go viral. And from that, um, you know, we just put our phone number at the end of the videos just to see if anyone else wanted this product or to see if we were crazy. And hundreds of people started texting in. And from that point, we're like, OK, we went to two stores, one in West Hollywood, one in Santa Monica. And, you know, we're, we're begging the owners like, look, we have hundreds of people that want this. Like, let us put the product in here and we're going to sell it. And they were like, what do you mean people are texting you? Like, you gave your phone number out. These are your friends. Yeah, they, whatever. They thought we were crazy. Uh, but long story short, you know, we put 150 cases, or we convinced them to put 150 cases at each store. We texted everyone. It was 10 a.m. December 2nd on a Wednesday. And we showed up not knowing if anyone was going to be there to buy it. And when we pulled up, there's lines out the door. We sold out in under an hour's pandemonium. And you know, at that point, we were like, okay, do we have something here? Can we repeat this? We went down to Orange County. We sold twice as much in half the time. San Diego was even bigger. Literally, lines wrapped like four city blocks long. We were selling hard seltzer. It's not, you know, there's a million options out there. So the fact that we were able to draw lines crazy, you know, did New York, Seattle, all three cities in the Bay Area. And, you know, at this point, that was like nine months ago. We went from zero followers, uh, zero sales. It's where we're at now where, you know, we're self-distributed in over 250 accounts in California. We're available in New York. We're uh, going to be expanding to Seattle soon um, in terms of distribution. Uh, yeah, it's just been crazy, crazy ride. Look, I, I, I am so impressed. Like really, I, I am, it is, it's, it's the way you got to build a company in today's age. You know what I mean? It's, it's, you got to have the energy, you got to have the passion, but then you, you got to have like that, that, that grit and fight into like places that, that you're not sure how it will work or where it should work. Let's just go push and see what we can do. And then to get the results, I, I can only imagine the feeling of what it was like when you went to the first one, like, man, everybody did show up. Like what? Like, yeah. uh, and, and so tell me this, like, is this like, are you the operator? Are you the CEO? Like, are you the finance Listen, line? Like, what is your role? We're definitely like a, a marketing led company yeah. right because at the end of the day you know there's a million brands out there and like jeremy's definitely the vision maker for that um he's then i'm more the yeah like the business operation side just because my experience in the drink industry now did you get financed through your family like how did you guys initially so finance the I, company? you know i put in uh you know my life savings uh another one of the guys that was early on who's our creative director uh brando put in a portion of his life savings to start this and you know we just got wrecked by COVID and like dishonest co-packers, you know, packaging issues, supplies, whatever. And we uh, did a little friends and family round just to get enough to get the first batch. Um, you know, but then after that, we, we were able to have these moments. We raised a little bit more money, but we've been bootstrapping. Like no one was taking a salary or anything up until this point. So we've been bootstrapping this. And then how did you end up in the accelerator program? Uh, I, you know, I, I'm trying, I think someone recommended it, like uh, an alumni recommended it. And then I talked to Trish and Trish is a pretty amazing person. So as soon as I talked to her, I was like, man, we got to get in this. Yeah. And and look, I, I think it's, it's the, it's, it's just another, for someone like you who is really pushing and has, um, and, and willing to, to push over and look under every rock to make it happen. Uh, I think the program is is a great fit because you it'll give you a ton of different resource and experience. And, and what is your goal ultimately is to create the profile and be able to raise the capital to go to the uh, really build the business the way that you want to build it. Is that sort of the goal right now? Yeah, I think uh, just in general, you know, what we're trying to build, you know, it, the businesses we look at that we idolize, you know, it's like Red Bull, you know, they're much, they're, 
they happen to sell drinks, but they're much more than that as a business. And I think that's kind of our goal with, uh, you know, where we see the vision for Nectar. And yeah, I mean, we're going to have to raise money along the way that uh, we're in the middle of raising some money right now. Um, so that we can do that. We've secured our supply chain, the co-packing and all of that. Uh, and we have a marketing engine that we think can scale. So it's just getting the funding to do it. Yeah. Look, I, I mean, I was laughing. I mean, there were so many funny things on the Instagram, you know, I'm in my TikTok guy, but man, you're killing me. Like it was, I mean, you know, even the, like the, the mission to have a million people taste the product and just like, you know, <laughs> just in the club trying to give it to security, then crying in the club. <laughs> like, it's like just even the wigs everywhere. Like, man, it, it it's, I just, it's done the right way, right? It's, a, it's an authentic, really smart, um, sort of pure way, uh, to, to create engagement and loyalty, um, in a product that, you know, people already love, you know, and, and I, I watched, um, you know, a friend of mine, uh, has liquid death, right? I don't know if you've ever heard yeah, of liquid it, death. Yeah. And so liquid death, um, you know, the, the founder and CEO was the creative director for street league, my professional skateboarding league. And, and we, um, we, he was just too creative for street league and, and not like, you know, anchored in the skate life enough it was too many big ideas that weren't connecting with skateboarding the right way. Right. And we parted ways. And then he, uh, immediately said, hey, I got this idea for a water company. Uh, and he showed us the funniest video ever of, you know, a guy water kills more people than anything else. I'm gonna put water in cans and make it look like beer. It's going to be liquid death. And we're just like, this guy can't run a company, right? Like, and you know, the company's like literally four years later, it's worth like two or $300 million. Yeah. I sat in this office where I record record this podcast, yeah. tout myself as like a, a curator of visionaries and ideas, and and said this. I don't know about this one. It's worth three hundred million dollars. Like not like ten years later, like you know, four years later. You know, and and to me, I just see a lot of that same energy that that I saw early on in that business and that idea that you guys have you know what i mean and 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 you know the difference is we couldn't have made it uh, the success that it is. He actually partnered with uh, Science, another um, sort of accelerator um, incubator uh, venture company based in Santa Monica, you know, and they really um, helped, you know, like evolve the business and really drive it and play a huge part in driving it to the next level. But again, I, I just only want to say that to you as it relates to, um, you know, how how the energy feels similar to me. And when the content's so engaging, it goes beyond the product um, becomes more of like, you just want to support those that create this fun, amazing brand type of thing Go, goes beyond the value proposition of the product. Cause again, like liquid death, it's just water. You know what I mean? It's uh, and but you'd rather have this fun, over the top, like crazy, funny version of it because you're going to get it anyway. And and I just think that there's um, there's the same sort of energy to to what you're creating. But I, I wanted to share that with you just to kind of give you uh, my perspective as someone that that knows what it's like to stare down in the eyes of a three hundred million dollar company and pass. And be like, I don't think so. I don't think it. I'm not sure it'll work. It's funny. You're good. You know, but I'll tell you, it, it changed the way I look at marketing's ability to win, yeah. you know, and, and I, when, when I think just hearing you speak and, and your way of approaching it, and even that experience in alcohol and your operating mind is the reason that it's, that you're even catching this momentum, regardless of the pain that you've gone through as every single person who's in their twenties and starts of alcohol brand goes through like they all, everybody goes through it. Like, you know, I have another uh, company I'm invested called beatbox. Um, yeah. and, and early on they pitched me the pitch that they were going to pitch to shark tank. And, you know, I'm, I was like, I just don't, I just don't think these guys just don't have a business yet. And, and Cuban gave him a million dollars, right? It's like, you know, and, but I loved their product as it related to the, 
the value proposition of basically, you know, we called it and helped them evolve it into like do the party math where one, one of these is like three and a half beers, right? So it's like the alcohol content and the wine based, uh, drink, um, just made it like, a, a you know, we helped them drive it to the world's tastiest party punch. So the value proposition was a, a, a little bit more clear there, but look now they're, they're exploding but it's 10 years in the making and, you know, multiple rounds of money and walking it to the cliff and like, you know, in the, hey, look, in, in, in the alcohol game, that's capital intensive and growing yeah. it. We always refer to like the plane hitting the trees, <laughs> like, right. It's like the capital's all gone and the value hasn't been created and the plane has just hit the trees. And then one investor puts in like a nut, you know, gets a little bit more money on a note and you know, the thing picks back up. <laughs> like the, those guys hit the trees, uh, like two or three times. And now they are, you know, uh, sailing, uh, in, into growth and it's, it's rewarding for them. And I know that they, they really enjoy it, but I, I, I thought you might find both of those, uh, interesting. Cause I, cause I see a lot of the similarities, um, in that, you know, but, but hit me with some questions you have, man. Uh, yeah. I mean, well, first off the really appreciate you even drawing any sort of line there, like liquid death, what they've been able to do is insane. And I think they're, they kind of feel the same way uh you know our mission statement is to build community and entertain with flavor and you know that doesn't necessarily mean with just the flavors of our hard seltzers it means with you know how we market ourselves the events we want to put on all that uh, so that's really really uh i guess comforting to hear you that you can see that as well um yeah i mean in terms of questions uh you know you, you come from ohio you moved to la uh and you took a big risk doing that um you know did did you stay, I guess, grounded or rooted with your your hometown? And is, was that important to you? And why was that important to you as like you moved to uh, like a new city without knowing anyone? Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm I always did forever, right? Because at the end of the day, you know, I would almost equate it to like you know. You know, LeBron James always hashtagging a kid from Akron. You know what I mean? It's like I, I still, d- despite the elevation and the evolution and and, and both in, in life as a whole, right? Who, who I am today as a person, I couldn't even fathom that someone like this even existed. There was no part of me that would become, would ever think that I would evolve into someone that was so strategic and then uh, believed so deeply in the law of attraction and manifestation and meditation and being super structured and, and driving all this and uh, you know, getting in a dome every day and meditating on how you want the future to become. But I'm, I'm the root of who I am is the fact that I did come from Dayton, Ohio, uh, Kettering, Ohio, and that I was uh, forced to carve my own path because what did I do? I grew up around a, a fixed mindset family uh, with a fixed mindset community. I went to a fixed mindset school and all of my family members said he's going to have to get a job like the rest of us. You know what I mean? And although I didn't allow that to ever stop me from from evolving and chasing and allowing my own experience and own growth towards dreams be what I actually believed in rather than what people said. And I never looked back once I got up on my mountain out here in Beverly Hills and said, see, I told you so, you know, look at me now I'm in the Beverly Hills. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I, I know it was part of my root and anchor and, and part of what made me and evolved me. So, you know, I never strayed far from it and, and always felt close to it. Um, but you do drift away from it at over time, you know, yeah. at, at, at the end of the day, you know, your close friends, um, that that's still living in Ohio, you talk to less and less, they grow and evolve and have kids and lives. And, and, and it's kind of part of the, the process of, uh, of an evolution. Uh, but uh, you know, my parents still live there. So, you know, to me, you know, I still got to go back 
uh, you know, fly into Ohio and then I got to, you know, be paraded around my parents' neighborhood to be like, here he is. You say, I know you love the show. Go ahead. Talk to him. You want to say anything to him? Like, Hey, how are you? <laughs> like, you know what I mean? It's a, uh, it's a still quite a, a funny experience. And I'm, and look, I'm still in awe of like, um, the life that I've been able to create and the success that I've been able to have, um, at such a consistent basis for so long, coming from a place like Kettering, Ohio. I mean, yeah, that's, uh, I guess, comfort again. It's, uh, you know, I moving out here from Philly, New Jersey, it's kind of, I'm trying to still figure out like how that all ties back to like who I am and, you know, what motivates me. So it's cool to hear the perspective. Um, you know, something that you've done uh, better than probably many other people is you know you, you started in a very niche field right skating it's very uh and like back then even it was more underground than what it is today and then pivoted not pivoted but like expanded that to you know all these other different areas the brand you've built it, it goes far beyond skating you've done all that without losing any brand equity uh, you know how i guess uh, or what kind of focus or priorities that you have as you were kind of expanding your brand outside of skating and you know how has that maybe changed over the years or what lessons have you learned from that whole process i mean look you, you got to understand that you know the body of work is authentic and i did it all my way um but there's a lot of ways throughout that process that i took some left turns that i regret you know what i mean i was in a rolling stone once without my shirt on you know what I mean? Like I, uh, had done some out of pocket, like, like brand deals that I'm embarrassed of. You know what I mean? I, I, I think the, the, the truth is, you know, in anything, in any aspect of, as you evolve and grow as a person, like you're, you always want to choose the projects, the passions, um, where you spend your energy and time in the stuff that's most authentic to you, you know? And, and I think for me, um, you know, skateboarding was that in my twenties, which evolved into making street league and street dreams. And Robin big was from a DC skate video and eventually fantasy factory. But, you know, my true passion and through line through all of that, uh, was, you know, some form of entertainment and business, right? So I was a professional skateboarder, uh, but I turned, I started my first company at 17. Like then I started all these different companies, including record labels and skate shops, all this random stuff. But then uh, an idea for a skate video became a television show. Now I'm in the mainstream and I am launched Street League and Street Dreams and all these additional sort of avenues. But then as I grew, I realized that my ultimate passion is business above all. And now in my forties, what am I doing? I'm in my multi-platform universe of venture creation, uh, media community and philanthropy, right? Where it's still the same sort of aspect. You're on this show with me. It's still a form of entertainment, only it's finally merged into this idea of how much I love creating businesses, how passionate I am of just speaking with other entrepreneurs and, and ultimately creating a platform that builds awareness to be able to get in front of uh, young entrepreneurs like you that can go and learn the journey and come back to me in three or four or five years when you're ready for uh, your next company and like remember that conversation I'll be like he was smart remember how good that marketing was let's go build this with all the knowledge that you've learned over the years you know like to me that's that's sort of the the elevation but it is it is always making decisions that you are going to be proud of, right? And, and make no mistake about it. In your life, every decision counts. What you live today, what you are experiencing today is based off of every decision you made in the past. And then what you're experiencing allows you to make a decision of what you want to create in the future. And at any time, you can be recreating what you want the future to look like and be much more cautious with your decision making to ensure what you experience is an authentic, true life to who you are. And you can do that. 
Do you know what I'm saying? Even all the way from Jersey. (laughs) No, I mean, that's great. Uh, I think authenticity is huge. I think that's a big part of uh, our differentiating factor as a brand and something the, you know, people always say like, what's your moat? You know, White Claw could come out with your flavors tomorrow, but you know, we're authentic to the brand that we are white call you can't copy what we're doing on a brand level so yeah look i don't i don't 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 even listen to you ain't you're not playing the moat game here you know what i'm saying you're playing the like we're we're building a community we're 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 playing the marketing game because you get it all right you want to know what white claw can't do is market you want to know who like look what look at all the seltzers where it's just bud light seltzer it's like you know so many people are launching seltzers nonstop. Yeah, you know what I mean? So it's it's your o- the only way you can build a moat is through marketing at this point. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because when people are texting you and a line shows up at a retailer, that's the only way that it's ever going to happen. Because if you just said, please put it in there, I'm, I know people are going to sell it because our flavors are different. They're not putting it in there. You know what I mean? So you're I mean, you're on the right path. And, and you're going to learn and evolve and, and get so, so much knowledge over these next couple of years, regardless of how uh, easy it may or may not be. You know what I mean? So, look, I, I appreciate you coming on here. I wish you the best of luck. And, and, and I'll be watching, man. I, I'll be watching and laughing. Can't wait to see you guys cl- crying in the club again. <laughs> I appreciate that. Well, I... Uh... I'd love to drop a box off to your house or send you one if you're if you want to try the liquid. So. Yeah, please too, man. Let me let me let me be one of those million people to to, to taste the product. <laughs> yeah, be huge. Okay, all, all the right, best. Man, appreciate it. All right, Very take care. Me. Hi, my name is Emily Smith, and I'm the founder of Newfix, a plant-based nutrition company focused on innovative high-protein foods. At New Fix, we believe that fueling your body with nutritious foods should never mean sacrificing a delicious taste. That's why we created Heavenly Protein Powder, the only protein that is 100% plant-based, easy to digest, has a short list of functional ingredients, tastes delicious with literally just water, and made with the world's cleanest and most sustainable organic American peas. Get your nutrition fix. New Fix. Emily Smith, welcome to Build with Rob. How are you? I'm doing great, Rob. How are you? Ah, oh, just, you know, doing doing what I love to do, and it's talking to entrepreneurs about their businesses. I just, I, I really, I get so much energy from speaking to entrepreneurs, and, and I love an entrepreneur that's health-focused and, and puts taste above everything in their product. You know what I mean? And before we get started, I want to make sure that you understand that I tasted all of the product because she's claiming nutritious and delicious and right in the middle is new fix. It is right. It's when you combine them. This is what it is. And without a doubt, um, both of the proteins were absolutely delicious. So you delivered, you absolutely delivered on on a heavenly protein. I want to make sure that you understand that. I, that I would not have allowed this to happen without actually tasting it. So congratulations on making that happen. Thank you, Rob. Means a lot, 100%. Taste is so important. When you go to a demo or you have people try your product. We try to not tell them anything about the product. First, we want them to taste it. If it tastes good, then we tell them all the great things, all the benefits. But if they don't like the taste, then there's not even a conversation to have. Yeah. And look, and, and for some reason, so many people, especially in, in the, the, in the protein world, especially like it's such an afterthought. Like it's like, it's really about this is how many grams it is, this is the cost per gram. You know, it's like, you know, that, that sort of aspect, but it's, you know, in all of my CPG, like consumable brands, it is like, if I don't feel like it tastes like heaven, you know what I mean? And that, then I know I won't be proud of it. Right. Like I want, when you taste one of our products to be like, Oh, wow. Like, oh, wow. You know, and, and, and I, I think it's amazing that that you've really captured it and you understood that from the very beginning, you know. So give me just a quick overview of of your company and sort of the stage that it's at right now. Yeah, definitely. So um, Newfix started the build out during the pandemic. So that's when the ideation came along. And then in June, um, just a couple months ago, that's when we launched our website, newfix.com. 
quickly started approaching the high-end retailers like Air One, Mother's Market, Central Market to actually get some shelf placement and have uh, just that reputation for the brand. It's super important for us um, to be visible to consumers uh, physically, especially after COVID. The digital world was overemphasized, I think, during COVID and people just missed a little bit of that in-store experience. Um, so launched at those stores, super successful so far. It's the number one selling plant protein at Air One Market, which is probably the most difficult retailer in the natural food space to get into because of their super strict standards and their customer that is extremely picky about what they're putting into their body. Yeah, how did you do that? How did you do that? Because it's a pretty difficult like undertaking. Like, how did you actually make that happen? So we actually approached Air One so early on in the process actually while we were formulating, we didn't even have our packaging, right? I remember going there one day with like a picture of our packaging on my phone and like a Ziploc of powder to someone who actually worked in the store. And we had a few people try it out. And I remember one person in particular, he mentioned, um, hey, like I'm feeling bloated, you know, like all protein powders bloat me. So I'm probably not the best person to try the pea protein. And we're like, but peas are such an amazing source of protein. There must be a better way to have consumers be able to digest it properly. So we started researching different enzymes. And that's when I realized, I'm like, hey, there's all these people who are lactose intolerant taking lactate to break down lactose for them. Maybe there's that same equivalent for protein. So that's when we discovered Aminogen, which is a patented, clinically tested digestive enzyme blend that breaks down protein for you so that you could actually get all those benefits, like you know the high grams of protein that they show you on the front of the packaging, um, actually get the nutrients, all the amino acids for your body and not have that bloating effect because your stomach's not having to do that heavy lifting. Is that ba- is that like technology work primarily with pea protein or is it like any protein? Protein in general. Yeah. Protein in general. It works extremely well with pea protein. Once we added aminogen in, it was game changing for people. We tested with a lot of different enzymes, but that was just the best one. And also consumers trusted it the most because you can just like Google it, look it up and see all the academic research that's been done on it. So, you know, to answer your question about Air One, how we got in, it's by opening up that relationship early on, making them a part of the process and also making sure their brand management team really liked the brand and, you know, simple things like the packaging, the logo. It's super important to have that feel. Integrated yeah. Hey, hey, I got to tell you that the logo itself. Okay. Like, uh, th- just the idea of like, oh God, I can't think of, um, your nutrition uh, the heavenly habits and unleash your potential. Right. Like, so it's like the wing for like unleashing your potential and then the heavenly habits of like the plant, like as part of making yeah. up the logo, uh, to me, that's genius. That's really next level branding and thought articulation, like for branding. Like now, where 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 did that come from? Is this your own idea? Did you hire an agency? So I have a little creative genius um, on my team, and that's um, Amanda, who's my sister, and she yeah. is a co-founder, and she is completely brilliant. And sometimes she'll just go on her computer for a few hours and come up with these designs and. My brain could never process anything like that. Uh, I'm more analytical. So it's super important to have those different skills on any team. Oh, that's amazing. I love that it is your, your sister and partner. And, and, and look, I I think even, even one of the most underestimated things that happens to people that are launching a brand is trying to outsource creative. Um, when you launch a brand, you need creative assets of so many creative assets and you're shaping and evolving the way it feels like on social media and, and, and paid media and all these different things, even how you end up designing the way that packaging is going to set and look in the store, right? It's, it's, there's a lot more complexities to getting design correct. Um, then I think people realize they think they could just hire somebody to design their packaging and box and it's just done. Right. And you're lucky to have somebody so close with you in the process to, to really evolve the way that the, the brand looks and feels. Cause it really does. Rob, you're spot on with that yeah. today. If we're not content companies, we're nothing. We got to be pumping out content morning, day, night. And I saw mine, right. I'm completely blown away with the marketing branding. It's an amazing, I just ordered the child pack. I'm still waiting for that to figure out which flavor is going to be best, but 
it is so important to have that asset on the team. Yeah. And, and look, and I, I think we approached it in, in a much similar way of really making a super clean, pure product. Now, now, you know, for us, you know, we pushed into nootropic infused and, and adaptogens and great tasting bars, which hadn't been done yet. Right. So we were able to position ourselves, um, as sort of a first mover in taking, uh, nootropics and adaptogens from supplements and, and drink mixes into, into the food space, uh, you know, and, and for me, when I look at the product, right? So you can tell people how how great tasting it is, but you're you're still in this landscape of, you know, like in extraordinarily competitive um, space, and 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 I do think like the way that the heroing of the pea and this American grown, hundred percent organic, like happiness, like you know, I just think there's a ton of value. In, in sort of how you're heroing that P that I, I, I think is important for you guys to le- lean into to be as, 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 as uh, to, to differentiate yourself, differentiate yourself, your, differentiate yourself as much as you can in the marketplace. Cause how do you see how you're going to position yourself, um, in, in order to take people away from their favorite proteins? I think the first thing is having the reputation of being the cleanest protein out there. And because protein powder has such a bad reputation right now, it's actually the perfect moment for us to come in and say, hey, listen, like we know there's a bad reputation and there's a couple of reasons why. Uh, The main one is because of contamination in them. So a lot of them get tested for high heavy metals, which is actually really scary for consumers when they hear about this. So most of people don't know why there's something wrong with it. They just know that there is. And the main reasons are like the contaminated soil, like I said, but also those big plastic tubs, which leak plastic into the powder. So it's a lot of education to consumers by saying, hey, we're the cleanest ones because look at the protein source. We use organic American grown peas. And also we don't use those plastic tub packaging. And part of that just needs to be integrated into the narrative over time. But like we said before, taste is number one. So having a lot of testimonial videos on social, having a lot of Instagram ads that are going to be showing uh, that feedback from customers is going to be, you know, mostly important for us. Yeah. And I mean, look, we, uh, you know, have a a supplement brand called Momentus, right? Um, And, you know, where the pressure is on making the very clean uh, NSF certified, you know, like, because it's all sold to the the professional sports teams and the big college teams, uh, having that NSF certified makes it, uh, takes it to sort of another level. However, it's extraordinarily expensive and, and really puts margin pressure. Uh, but even though we did that, we still had to transition to the sustainable, uh, packaging and not the plastic packaging. Cause we went through all that. And then what do we got? We got this big old plastic tub, um, you know, that's, that's tainting the quality, uh, of, of that protein and, and, you know, that business itself of really driving super clean, very premium products also drives it to a, a much smaller audience. It's more expensive. It's for a much, uh, a, a, you know, someone that's, that's very athletic and, and what everything that goes in their body really matters. Uh, so it was difficult to scale into sort of the, the mainstream sort of distribution outlets and potential of it. And so it really ended up being direct to consumer and, and, um, pro teams, you know what I mean? So look, what, what type of uh, questions you got for me? Um, I wanted to know what you eat in a day because you look pretty good and uh, clearly your mind's in the right place. You wake up very like motivated and you're able to get through with high energy. So it'd be awesome to hear that. Well, uh, look, I'm, I don't eat much in a day. I think that's why I would be uh, so filled with energy. Right. And, and I think you probably know it. I, I assume you're probably uh, extraordinarily healthy. Uh, and for me, it's, you know, give me some, some, some vegetables and greens and, and lean meats, right? Like I, I, I don't think I could ever go fully plant-based. And then I try to intermittent fast every single day. You know, I try to have two meals, one around 10 or 11 and, and one around five, 
uh, and, and I, I keep it ex- super consistent, you know, and, and, and a lot of times, you know, I'll have uh, collagen and protein and blueberries and, and almond milk with some liquid vitamins that I have to kind of be sort of like my, my supplement aspect of, of, of how I add that to sort of, uh, the overall mission. But look, energy comes, look, energy is the source of all aspects of your life. And energy is drained by so many things. And a great diet is one of them, right? It is because if you have a bad diet, you're going to sleep terrible. You sleep terrible. You're drained you make some bad decisions like, and, and you're experiencing those bad decisions. Now you're living in regret that takes energy. You're, you don't have clarity on your goals and where you're headed. That takes energy. Your, your relationship with those around you, your, your, uh, not managing property that properly that takes energy for me, you know, beyond diet and being healthy is, you know, I really did, seek to design a life that would opt and I, I, I seek, I sought to design a life that was optimized for energy, right? So I first cleared out all of the things that took energy from me. And then I began to build habits and systems that were, were built to give me energy and not take from it, from me. Right. And wow. I mean, then you, then you add a super clean diet on top of that and then getting great sleep and then having being decisive, clear, having sharper goals, having more purpose, having more motivation, having more abundance, having more love, being a better communicator. That That is the snowball, the compound effect that I was able to create by focusing on just energy and, and make no mistake, diet uh, it is a huge part of that, you know, no, what about you? What do you eat in a day? I, uh, eat like similarly time-wise where like, you know, have breakfast around like 11 AM and always have a new fix shake for breakfast. I uh, usually have like a full frozen banana. So it's like a smoothie bowl, almond milk, some berries and have some new fix. And then, um, you know, a few hours later, definitely like to have an actual lunch. Um, where I'll always have like big salads, you know, I'm not a hundred percent plant-based. I try to do like breakfast and lunch, uh, plant-based and then for dinner, just, uh, you know, eat regular foods and whatnot. I think a big part of it is I love traveling and I like meeting people and discovering new restaurants and places. And I find that's a bit challenging to do being a hundred percent plant-based and my philosophy on life is very much so about moderation. So I'm not like a hundred percent sober. Right. But I still like, you know, have maybe a drink a week or something like that. Right. Like not so black and white. And that's just kind of how I was raised eating wholesome foods and making sure that, um, we're not restricting ourselves too much. uh, if We don't need to, but the same time for me, I think what's helped me a lot with energy and making sure that I get that is like you said, diet, but also like having your head in the right place. And I think society today has like glamorize you know mental health like a lot like where we're putting a lot of emphasis on it and like part of me thinks it's like very simple in terms of being happy it's just gratitude like if I were to say like why am I happy it's really just because I'm grateful for whatever happens in my life the good but what's even harder is being grateful for the bad so I'm actually grateful when things don't go my way because I know there's a higher purpose that I just can't see in that exact moment and that's what drives me forward every day and When I look back in my life and I'm like, hey, why didn't I get that job in investment banking that I really want? Look where I am now. I'm from I'm from Canada, from Montreal. Right. I moved to Los Angeles, living my dream, entrepreneur, like killing it out there, like, you know, 130 K in sales just in two months. Like this doesn't happen to everyone. And part of why it's happening to me is because other things that I wanted back then didn't work out and better things came along. And for me, that's life itself. Yeah. And look, you, you, you built the right foundation, right? Cause you're building the foundation for sustainable happiness, right? Cause, cause at the end of the day, you want all aspects of your life to, to basically operate in harmony. And then you want to grow into the ideal version of yourself, right? So as long as you keep 
keeping that eye out in the distance of this is what I would like to to be next year, the year after that, five years, 10 years. And you keep that balance of, of allowing harmony between uh, who you are and how you take care of yourself and your own mental health and everything you need for that, what you do, your passions, your interests, your work, your finances, and then ultimately how you live, uh, your relationships, your love and connect in, connection and your adventure, right? So you can have uh, a couple drinks here and there. You're living life. You can, uh, you know, enjoy these restaurants and, and still, uh, live in that, not necessarily moderation, but harmony with who you are as a person. And then if you grow now into clear goals over time, uh, you will really build the true happiness in life that I'm sure that, that ultimately you are seeking just as everybody else is seeking. 100% Rob. All right. Well, look, it was an absolute pleasure to connect with you. Um, I wish you the best. I think you, you got something really cool and, and you have the, the true do or dire mentality and way of thinking and, 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 and building this brand and pushing it into retail and, and launching omni channel instead of thinking you're going to fall in love with direct to consumer. You did everything the right way. Uh, you're obviously, uh, part of a great program that is, uh, the use UCLA Venture Accelerator. And, and I think, you know, you really impressed me. And I, I think you, you really are going to find both success in business and life as you move forward. So it was a pleasure to connect. Thank you, Rob. It was great being here today. And if you want more new fix, I mean, you know where to find me. So, uh, <laughs> without a time. doubt, without a doubt. All Enjoy. the best. Appreciate it. Well, there you have it. You know, really smart people with really smart ideas with a really smart program to help nurture, support, and take them to the next level. Thank you to the Venture Accelerator at UCLA Anderson for for playing a part of Build with Rob, giving me access to these great entrepreneurs to where we could really have some insightful conversations uh, and have a lot of fun. And, and, And again, I just love talking all things uh, business, both creation and business and life. You know, I love talking about it all. So thank you all for listening. Uh, Wherever you listen to this podcast, make sure you subscribe. Um, Again, you want to play a part in building companies with us? Head over to DeerDickMachine.com and and become a machinist. Sign up. Uh, Be a part of our world of creating these businesses. Give us your feedback. You know, who knows? You might end up on this show. Uh, You got an idea for us? Make a video. Submit it. You know, uh, you could end up on this show and maybe, just maybe, we could build a company together. Uh, And only if you have like a clear idea in your mind of what it could be and you truly know in your heart of hearts that it's going to be an extraordinary, amazing, profitable, sustainable, acquirable business and you got that do or die or spirit... That says no matter what, I'm going to see this thing into reality, then you are one of us. See it, believe it, do it. Till next time.